Section four of the Early Tudors by Charles Edward Moberly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter three Lambert Simnel, The Britannia War, fourteen eighty six to fourteen ninety two. On November seventh, fourteen eighty five, Henry the seventh held his first parliament thus seeming to fulfil the general expectation that as a lancastrian sovereign he would follow the example of henry the fourth and henry the fifth in taking kindly to constitutional government his house of lords contained only twenty-seven lay peers a fact which has been supposed to prove how many families had become extinct during the wars of the roses in reality however only two had thus failed for want of heirs and the number of peers in this parliament was so small because no summonses had been sent to twenty-five who were likely to be malcontent henry wished in the first place to have the succession settled upon his own heirs by whatever wife this was done and at his strongly expressed desire confirmed by a papal bull he also wanted the attainders of his supporters to be formally reversed and not merely cancelled by his act in employing them as he had done in several cases he intended to issue a general pardon of his enemies with some exceptions yet was unwilling that parliament should enact this choosing rather to deal with individuals who might be made to pay dearly for it and thus the better enable him to do for the present without any parliamentary revenue beyond the tonnage and poundage which was granted to him for life for the same purpose he declared invalid all alienations of property from the crown made since fourteen fifty four he kept also a keen eye on the fines imposed upon foreign merchants for non-employment that is for attempting to dispose of their wares in england without buying a return cargo there as if born to the manner of english royalty he picked out for his ministers two of the ablest churchmen of the time morton bishop of ely his old and tried supporter, and Fox, Bishop of Exeter. The services of men like these on his council would be invaluable, yet would cost him nothing, seeing that they might be paid by translation to richer bishoprics. After giving indemnity to all the king's partisans for any injury done to the opposite party, and enacting that Gascon wines should only be brought to England in English, Irish, or Welsh vessels, the Parliament was on the point of being prorogued, when the members humbly petitioned Henry to be pleased to marry Elizabeth. With this request he complied, as we have already seen, yet her coronation was not for the present allowed. Considering himself now fairly established on the throne, Henry resolved on a progress to the north, the great home of the Yorkist party, whence Richard III had recently drawn his best and most faithful troops on the way thither he kept his easter joyously at lincoln but was rudely disabused of his confidence in his own fortune by an insurrection raised by lord lovell sir humphrey stafford and sir thomas stafford who had been in sanctuary at colchester since bosworth field the staffords were sons of the humphrey stafford slain by cade in fourteen fifty and like lord lovell had fought for richard at bosworth they made for Worcester, apparently trusting for their safety to local connections there. These, however, failed them entirely, and their forces dispersed on Henry's first proclamation of pardon. Lord Lovell fled to Lancashire and thence to Flanders, and the Staffords took sanctuary at Cullum near Abingdon, but were removed from it for trial on the ground that the place had not sufficient privileges as a sanctuary to shelter traitors the elder brother was then executed the younger pardoned as having acted under his influence this rebellion had little or no connection with the feeling in favour of the house of york which was still very strong in england and attributable to two main causes in the first place the lancastrians including the present king were hated by the violent and unreasoning part of the community for having lost under henry the sixth the English provinces in France, the wars occasioned by which had been such perennial sources of plunder to Englishmen serving there, 
and the white rose was therefore popular as more or less representing the idea of empire abroad in the second place traders and manufacturers held the same opinions on different grounds for from the very accession of edward the fourth the head of the house of york much had been done for them by the numerous commercial treaties which he made with foreign powers and by his personal interest in trade especially had the greater strength of his government guaranteed our sea-coasts and trading vessels from those attacks of pirates which remained for more than a century longer the invariable mark of a weak or careless rule in england we can therefore readily understand the strength of yorkist feeling in london and in the north seeing that so large a part of english trade and english manufactures belonged to these districts in ireland the same sentiment existed but appears to have sprung chiefly and characteristically from a remembrance of the gentle sway of richard duke of york as lord deputy there in fourteen fifty nine when after the defeat of his party at blower heath he crossed the channel seized the government of ireland in defiance of ormond and the lancastrians and proceeded to hold a parliament there which claimed to be independent of the english parliament and courts of law george duke of clarence had also been loved in ireland for his father's sake and had distinguished himself by his courteous behaviour to the people between the years fourteen sixty one and fourteen seventy and afterwards from fourteen seventy two till his death to arouse and stimulate all these feelings of opposition to henry's government was the lifelong purpose of margaret of york the sister of edward the fourth who had been second wife to charles the bold duke of burgundy after the death of her husband in his war with the swiss in fourteen seventy seven this princess had seen the french part of his dominions absorbed by louis the eleventh and the flemish provinces passing by the marriage of mary her stepdaughter into the hands of maximilian of austria the young and chivalrous son of frederick the third emperor of germany she herself however retained so much independence in the districts which had been assigned to her as a dowry on her marriage that it was vain to appeal to the emperor when she did acts hostile to england the marriage of her niece with henry had by no means conciliated her she rather hated elizabeth as a deserter from the white rose her ill-feeling found its opportunity in fourteen eighty six when lambert simnel was brought forward as a pretender to the english crown the broad facts of the imposture were that this youth was represented as being really the earl of warwick whom henry had under lock and key in the tower when therefore we find that his cause was supported by the earl of lincoln richard the third's own nephew who had once been heir presumptive to the crown it seems plain that lincoln's hope must have been to get rid of henry by means of this deception and then quietly to put the puppet aside and stand up for his own right adopting in fact the plan which buckingham would probably have pursued toward henry himself if the rebellion of fourteen eighty three had been successful as so many people knew the true lord warwick by sight and as henry took care that all london should see him on the way to and from st paul's it was thought best that simnel should make his first appearance in ireland there he found men's minds fully prepared for a yorkist insurrection accordingly his cause was taken up by lord kildare who was then ruling ireland as deputy for the duke of bedford and he was actually crowned at dublin may twenty fourth fourteen eighty seven as edward the sixth without a sword being drawn at this point margaret struck in to aid him showing herself as courageous as her husband but with a feminine craft that was all her own she helped a skilful commander named martin schwartz to equip nineteen vessels carrying about two thousand veteran soldiers and simnel sailed for england with these and with some irish troops commanded by lord kildare besides a few englishmen under lord lincoln landing at fouldry in lancashire he made first for york striving hard as he went to keep his men orderly and humane 
so that the impression of his being really the rightful king might strengthen. By this time, however, Henry, after making a pilgrimage to Walsingham, had fixed his headquarters at Nottingham, as Richard III had done just before Bosworth. Both kings, considering this place well situated for commanding the various roads from the north to London. He had also much to encourage him, for popular though the Yorkist cause might be, most Englishmen disliked the thought of having a king imposed upon them by a mob of Irishmen and Flemings. Accordingly, Lord Lincoln had to engage at Stoke near Newark, June 16th, with little more than the force which he had brought from Ireland. The battle was obstinate, there being little thought of giving quarter to foreigners or Irish. Lord Lincoln fell with Martin Schwartz and Lord Lovell, unless indeed the story is true that Lovell was concealed for several years in a strong room at Minster Lovell in Oxfordshire, and at last died there from the negligence of a servant who failed to provide him with food. The unhappy Irish, armed as they were with nothing better than darts and knives, were of course cut in pieces. Content with the death of his chief enemies in battle, Henry pardoned the nobles who had assisted in the Dublin coronation on their pleading that they had been misled, not only by the very governor whom the king had placed over them, but by the archbishop of Dublin and the chief part of the clergy. He even spared Simnel himself, making him first a turnspit in his kitchen, and then by way of promotion a falconer. In the course of the next year, he, with not a little quiet humor, exhibited the pretender dressed in his livery to the Irish nobles who were visiting London, and enjoyed immeasurably the uncourtly execrations into which they burst at the sight. After his victory, Henry thought it prudent to conciliate Yorkist feeling by allowing the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. This took place November 25, 1487. He could afford to comply thus far, as he had just made a northern progress of a very different character from the one which he had designed in the preceding year. His object now had been to punish all who had adhered to the rebellion, and when we hear that for this purpose he proclaimed martial law, it is easy to judge of the terror which his presence must have caused, in spite of his generally preferring fines to bloodshed. With regard to such proclamations, it is satisfactory to learn from the highest authority that the rebellion being at an end, they were quite illegal. Indeed, an act of indemnity was afterwards required to protect from penalties those who had used force under them. Strangely enough, one of those on whom the king's hand fell heavily was his wife's mother, who, on the first report of Simnel's rebellion, was imprisoned for the rest of her life in a nunnery at Bermondsey, with little allowance for her support. This was done by authority of the king in council, the reason alleged, namely, that she had placed her daughters in King Richard's hands instead of remaining with them in sanctuary, was so plainly frivolous that the object in making it must have been to suggest that there was much more behind. Lord Bacon conjectures that she may have borne a part in teaching Simnel how to make people think him a prince, from a notion that Henry was unkind to her daughter, and a consequent wish that he might be slain or deposed. Yet he appears to have been on the whole an affectionate husband, although we are told some years later that Margaret, Henry's mother, was somewhat tyrannical to her daughter-in-law. On this view it must be acknowledged that the situation was strained, for the Lady Margaret, Lancastrian to the backbone, was allowed by Henry to regulate on the most critical occasions all the details of Elizabeth's household, to the utter exclusion of her Yorkist mother, who must surely have been more or less than a woman and a mother-in-law, if she could have calmly endured such exclusion. Perhaps we need go no further to account for her ruin. Henry's second parliament was now held, November ninth, 1487. It established for the first time the Court of Star Chamber for reasons and in a manner which will be stated in another chapter, where also its statute against carrying off women will be described. The main subject which it had to deal with was the critical state of affairs in Bretagne. 
here Duke Francis, at whose court Henry had long lived, was now in extreme old age, and as he had no son, the question was what should become of his province when he died. The determined resolution of Anne of Beaujeu to bring about the union of Bretagne to France by a marriage between Charles the Eighth and its heiress Anne was creditable to her patriotism. Her personal interest was all the other way, as Ferdinand and Isabella had, in 1486, promised that if she arranged a marriage between their daughter and Charles the Eighth, they would support her in claiming a perpetual regency in France, their hope being that she would maintain between the two countries the peace which was certain to come to an end if Charles assumed the full powers of the French crown. England was still more strongly against the union between France and Britannia, and not unnaturally so, considering the great danger to our navigation from the long line of coast which would thus come into French hands instead of being hostile, as it generally had been while under the separate government. Doubtless our mariners knew well the fact remarked on in our own time by the Duke of Wellington, how clearly ships going along our coast may be detected at a great distance by the light on their sails from the southward sun, while French ships on the other side escape notice and pursuit from their sails being in shade. Troubles between Britannia and France began even in Francis's lifetime, for the Duke received and befriended the Duke of Orléans, afterwards Louis the Twelfth, who, after the fashion of heirs presumptive, had raised against the regent's power the war of the public good already alluded to. Accordingly, in the preceding September, an embassy had been sent to England by the French government requesting Henry to remember his old obligations to France, and either to join in the attack on Britannia or at least to remain neutral in the war. The ambassadors reached him at Leicester, and were almost immediately asked whether it was true that Charles the Eighth was planning a marriage with Anne. They professed to be scandalized at the very suggestion. It was well known, they said, that their master was affianced to Margaret, the daughter of Maximilian, king of the Romans. Indeed, this very young lady had for some time been residing in Paris and receiving a French education. Besides this, they declared that Charles was arranging an expedition into Italy. His views, therefore, were in a direction quite opposite to that of Britannia. The ambassadors might have added that Maximilian himself was the only person whom Anne would at the time hear of as a husband, as indeed she afterwards married him by proxy. Henry replied by a counter-embassy offering his mediation for the re-establishment of peace between Britannia and France. Charles the Eighth declared that such an arrangement was just what he most ardently desired, but would it not be well, he asked, that Erswick, the English ambassador, should go to Rennes on his way home, and come to an equally clear understanding with the Breton government? This could not well be refused, and the result was just what Charles had foreseen. The answer to Erswick was really given, not by Francis the Second, but by the Duke of Orléans, whose interest was entirely against peace. Louis would hear of no terms of accommodation. He also urged most strongly that the union of France and Burgundy must be contrary to English interests. On this Charles asked Henry to continue his mediation till peace was brought about, but at the same time announced his own intention of at once going on with the warlike operations. He therefore invaded Britannia and besieged Nantes, June 1487, and at this time a few English volunteers under Lord Woodville went over to help the Breton, a proceeding at which Henry professed himself very indignant. This was the state of things on which the Parliament of November 1487 had to decide. They were asked, point-blank, by Archbishop Morton whether or no they would advise the king to ally himself with Britannia against France. Morton told them that an honorable foreign war would be better for Henry than the domestic tumults which had given so much trouble of late. The position of England as to the continent had, he remarked, 
been much altered for the worse of late by the absorption of burgundy into the dominions of france and austria were they to allow britannia their own trusty confederate to be constantly joined with france against them besides such a precedent of the greater being allowed to swallow up the less would be a fatal one for small countries like scotland portugal and many of the states of germany these arguments seemed conclusive to the members who would naturally also fear the loss of breton trade as we then obtained from thence our chief supplies of linen and canvas and a subsidy for the war was unanimously voted henry would not however begin hostilities without another embassy and before this came to an end the battle of st Aubin had been fought the duke of orleans taken prisoner and lord woodville slain with most of his men july twenty eighth fourteen eighty eight somewhat confused at this effect of his long delay henry at once sent over lord brooke one of his companions in exile with eight thousand men yet this commander could not or would not bring the french to battle and after the death of francis the second which occurred september ninth the english finding that no one claimed them as allies simply returned to england five months after their departure for france this of course left matters for the present in the hands of the french government which showed it must be admitted considerable tact in the management of difficult circumstances beginning by claiming only charles's right as suzerain to break the marriage of anne with maximilian as being contrary to the interests of france this was done and the unlucky king of the romans had both to lose his wife and to take back the little daughter whom he had hoped to make queen of france he had however gained more than one point by these transactions for though britannia was finally lost to him and though the duchess anne became the wife of charles the eighth december fourteen ninety one yet the lady never forgot that she had once been queen of the romans and was perpetually plotting in favour of his family indeed on one occasion she attempted to marry her daughter to charles of spain maximilian's grandson and thus in defiance of the salic law to make france part of his overgrown dominions besides this the english before the hope of maximilian's marrying anne was over had supported him vigorously against his own rebellious subjects at bruges ghent ypres and slush the popular party in the cities had invited the french to their aid and under pretence that the safety of the garrison of calais was threatened by their revolt henry sent about two thousand men under lords morley and daubeny who inflicted a heavy blow upon the french besiegers of Newport. thus both in britannia and on the northeastern frontier of france there had been fighting between the english and french while at the same time henry and charles strongly maintained that the peace between the countries was unbroken the subsidy for the war granted by henry's third parliament in fourteen eighty nine was not levied without great difficulty in the north of england it was opposed most strenuously in yorkshire in the bishopric of durham the people maintaining that the miseries which they had been suffering made such payments impossible in fact they seem to have been just able to tolerate a lancastrian sovereign if he for his part never asked them for money the king ordered the duke of northumberland to enforce the collection but on the first attempt he was murdered by the recusants on this the earl of surrey who had been lately released from the tower where he had been prisoner since the beginning of the reign was ordered to take the command against them henry himself leading up a reserve force in case of disaster however the rebels were put down before it arrived their chief leader sir john egremont fled to the duchess of burgundy while the plebeian rioters were hanged in considerable numbers at about the same time with these events henry heard of the death of james the third of scotland whose friendship he had repeatedly tried to win obtaining from him in fourteen eighty seven a truce for seven years renewable for similar periods james died miserably in consequence of an accident which threw him from his horse and left him stunned and defenceless fourteen eighty eight to be murdered by one of the rebels who had just defeated his troops at soakyburn 
there is something really amusing about henry's pomp of preparation in fourteen ninety two for a war with france to avenge the absorption of britannia which he had failed in hindering the warlike spirit of england had been strongly stimulated by the news of ferdinand and isabella's capture of granada from the moors which arrived in the spring of that year the city having surrendered on the second of january this indeed was an event of which it would be hard to exaggerate the importance for the mohammedan power had till then appeared irresistible and the fall of constantinople in fourteen fifty three had invested the sultans with a thousand claims as representing the empire of constantine which might at any moment be pressed in the most alarming manner in fourteen eighty six mohammed the second had made his famous descent upon otranto intending to use this as a base of operations first against rome and italy then against the other states of europe an enterprise which was hindered by nothing but his death in the following year and the succession of the unwarlike bajazet the tide had now been turned by spanish valour islam had lost the chief outwork of its power and the victory had added to the territories of castile and aragon a country of brilliant fertility and resource the possession of which had an effect in consolidating the spanish monarchy superior even to that produced in france by the annexation of burgundy england had been represented at the siege of granada only by one gallant volunteer lord scales who had greatly distinguished himself in the early part of the war nevertheless the event was celebrated by a service of triumph held at st paul's and archbishop morton who had now at henry's express request been made a cardinal congratulated the vast assembly on the close of the seven hundred years of war with the unbelievers in spain and the certainty that numberless souls would now be gained to the kingdom of christ stirred to the emulation of such prowess the parliament allowed henry a former act notwithstanding to raise a benevolence for the french war it was on this occasion that cardinal morton devised his celebrated fork ordering his commissioners to press hard men who spent much as this proved them to be rich and also men who spent little as it was plain that they must be saving largely tournaments and military exercises were held everywhere to stir the blood of the people and a striking success in flanders excited still more enthusiasm the duke of saxony pretending a wish to arbitrate between his ally maximilian and his rebellious subjects at bruges had been admitted into that city with a small force instead however of staying there and communicating with the magistrates he passed out unchecked by the gate leading to dom and slush and seizing the former of these towns cut off bruges from the sea access to which was all important for its trade on this henry allowed his troops to help maximilian by besieging slush which commanded the embouchure of the canal leading to bruges this he was more inclined to do as ravestein the leader of the insurgents had made slush the headquarters of a vigorous system of piracy he therefore sent sir e poynings with a considerable force which assailed the castles while the duke of saxony besieged the town after much obstinate fighting the place surrendered and the rebellion against maximilian was practically at an end very mainly through english help this however did not overcome henry's reluctance to plunge further into the war true he had assembled a force not less than twenty six thousand strong but the question of ways and means constantly weighed on his mind maximilian was above all things impecunious his father the old emperor frederick the third l'homme le plus chiche qui fut jamais as philippe de comines calls him could not be reckoned on for much subsidies were hard to wring from the people at home and even if collected their value was trifling compared with the vast expense of such a war in which the commonest archer would be paid at least sixpence a day a sum as we have seen equal to six shillings of our money tidings also came that ferdinand of aragon had just made a treaty with france on most advantageous terms receiving back roussillon and perpignan which his father had pledged to france for three hundred thousand crowns accordingly though henry sailed for calais october sixth 
leaving orders for the army to rendezvous there, and even began the siege of Boulogne as an installment of the sovereignty which he claimed over all France. Yet he was not insensible to the advantage of negotiating, and allowed a peace to be concluded at Etaples, November 3rd, receiving under the name of expenses a sum of 127,000 livres, besides a pension or tribute of 6,000 livres a year to make good what he had spent in Bretagne. Thus the war ended, not heroically, we must admit, yet how much better would it have been for England if Henry's successor had been more like him in hating useless conquests. The present king's motives were doubtless mixed enough. What his enemies called avarice had much to do with his conduct, and he also feared war in general as tending to raise up competitors for a throne in some sense gained by conquest. Avarice, however, is hardly a fault when it takes the form of sparing the people taxes, and when we hear of so many sovereigns plunging into battle in order that their title may not be canvassed. We ought surely to have a good word for the king who thought that the permanence of his reign best secured by peace. Thus much at least must be admitted, that inspiration itself would hardly have guided Henry better at this juncture than did his own mental habits and tendencies for a danger was soon to burst upon him which required his very fullest attention. Well for him that it did not find him hampered by a dangerous foreign conflict in which success was unlikely and almost sure to be useless even if attained. End of section 4